Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Today is Saturday, February the 3rd, 2018. We are in Season 3, Episode 5. Our show can be found around the web at wolfman.com, barefootbushcraft.com, aroundthecabin.com, Freedomizer Radio, Canadian Preppers Network, Prepper Survival Homestead, American Prepper Network, SurvivalCentral.net, iTunes, and many other fine websites. I am your host, the Wolfman. Thank you very much for joining us today. In today's episode, we are going to talk about a man who could have had an easier time in the wilderness if he had some survival skills, the Pharaoh Syrian Rod, and we are going to speak to our special guest, adventurer and dog musher, Justin Allen, who is mushing his dogs over 3,000 kilometers across Canada from Manitoba to New Brunswick. So welcome everyone. It is a blustery, freezing cold day in the Niagara region, Ontario, Canada, where we broadcast from. It is about minus 12 degrees outside. Super, super cold. You certainly wouldn't want to go outside with a whole lot of bare skin out there. You want to make sure that you are all covered up and and have a good time. It was a little sunny today, which was always nice. So I want to remind everyone, of course, about the annual Preppers Meet, July 6, 7, and 8, just outside of Owen Sound, Ontario. Really fantastic time you will have. Barefoot Bushcraft has been a part of that event since the beginning. We usually offer archery, axe throwing services. This year we'll also be doing friction fire and uh, ferrocerium rod fire starting. You will learn all kinds of great hard outdoor skills which means they are uh, usually physical skills you will get to practice you'll learn soft skills which are theoretical skills Uh, it is put on by a gentleman by the name of Che who does uh, from time to time he has a uh, small segments of the show so uh, if you're in the area or can get to the area for that it is a fantastic fantastic time to go so we're going to go along here and get started with our first segment in the news. So in the news today, we're going to talk about uh, an article from January the 4th, 2018. So it's uh, almost a month old. Basic bush survival skills could have seen hiker lost in the Grampians but have been found sooner. And this comes from ABC Radio Melbourne. Simple survival skills may have helped a man lost in Victoria's Grampians for five days been helped found sooner. Joe Ascui was found alive and well in the National Park, only one kilometer from his car, after he wandered off a bush track and couldn't find his way back. Emergency services searched the rugged terrain for several days to find the 50-year-old, who eventually emerged from the bush with scratches on his legs, dehydrated and very hungry. Mr. Ascui survived by drinking water from a local river and used a cave for shelter. Bob Cooper, bushcraft expert who runs local survival courses, says Mr. Ascui should have been more visible. A lot of people make shelters out of natural products like tree branches and leaves, then they get inside them and no one can see them. A quality rescue blanket is only $20. They are easy to see color, usually hunter green or that uh, blaze orange. They have silver on the, so- on the outside. If he'd been out in the open or, or had one of those blankets, he would have been easy to see. Um, if, he, if he left it out just a little bit, he could have even made it into an arrow and people would have understood what direction he was going. Mr. Cooper said it was lucky Mr. Askui was close to the water. He warned that those venturing out into the wilderness need to constantly plan ahead. They need to make a note uh, where you're headed. I mean, leave it and leave a note in your car of where you're headed on the dashboard if necessary, if you don't have anyone else to tell. Um, Then in your mind say, if I get lost in that location, all I have to do is walk in this general direction and I'm going to find the road. If you, You don't have to stay lost if you know where your emergency exit is. When the sun is setting, you can use your shadow. When you walk facing west, this the shadow should be facing east. It's all a mind game. The more you know, the less you have. The knowledge will dispel the fear. He said, contrary to what many people believe, food is actually the last thing you really need to worry about. Your priorities need to be water, warmth, shelter, signals. Actually, the last priority is food. It's very rare anyone ever dies of starvation in a wilderness situation. People tended to lose one kilogram a day when they were lost. 
uh, and police estimate that Mr. Ascui lost eight kilos. Mr. Cooper said, although Mr. Ascui claimed he ate gum leaves, they're actually not edible. They have eucalyptus in the leaves, and other animals don't eat them, he said. There's a lot of great bush food out there, but you have to know what you're looking for because it's very easy to poison yourself. Empty plastic water bottles may have always been useful. Believe it or not, you can boil plastic water bottles, um, Mr. Cooper said. If you put a little bit of wire around it, fill it full of water and take the cap off, you can put that over the hottest of flames and possibly um, inside a fire. Even the most flimsy 600 milliliter water bottle that you can find can get the water to boil. It'll shrink a little bit, uh, but you can still reuse the bottle. He said the plastic bottle filled with water could also act as a magnifying glass to even start the fire. But he warned people need to be very, very careful if lighting a fire in the bush. You need to make sure the area is safe and it's not windy. So there you have it. Mr. Askui got lost in the woods about a month ago. Uh, got to be banged up, uh, but he managed to come out okay. So this, of course, comes back to the things that we talked to ad nauseum here on the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show, that you need to practice your skills. You need to get out there. You need to learn this stuff if you're going to participate in these outdoor adventures. Again, it's basic, basic things you need to learn. How to start a fire, how to find water, understanding your area. For example, in this article, it came from Australia. He talked about gum leaves that had eucalyptus in them. For me, as somebody in the north, uh, you know, in, in the north, in the Western Hemisphere, that is completely uh, foreign to me. But it's not an area that I would hike in. If I I know all of the edible plants, and more importantly, the non-edible plants in, in my environment, if I were to go and hike in Australia it would stand to reason that you would wish to do the same. You would want to find the plants that you can't eat. Now, when I took a uh, an internship back in the days uh, when I was in, in, in university, I took an internship for plants, and I took, it was a couple of hundred hours um, internship with one of Ontario's foremost plant experts. Uh, I believe the organization he runs is called Earth Tracks. He was telling myself and the students that it's more important to learn the things that can hurt you than the things that can't. He described it like this. If there's, say, for example, 10 plants in your local area that can harm you, there's probably 500 other plants out there. So which is going to be easier to learn? Is it going to be easy to learn the 500 plants that that will be good for you things you know so you're going to have to visit them four or five or six times a year visit them every month understand their growth cycles measure them get to know them see what they look like when they're again in their seed growth cycle in their uh, full growth cycle in their um, you know as they wind down for winter or would it be easier to just learn the stuff that's going to hurt you so that sort of makes sense that it would uh, you would certainly want to um, learn the things that can hurt you more than you can learn the things that are good for you. Because if I'm picking up this plant and I say, it's not foxglove, I can eat it. And it may make me a little sick, but it won't kill me. Just a certain theory. Of course, everybody out there has a different theory on the way that these can be done. That is that is the way I uh, I do things. Now, the other thing, of course, in this article, this gentleman, unfortunately, didn't have any skills. If he had the opportunity to, um, you know, have have a ferro rod on him, have uh, a water canteen on him, even a water bladder on him, they make these new things now called uh, uh, a life straw, right? Which uh, it doesn't reduce all the risk of the chemicals, but it removes a significant amount of the crap and bacteria and things like that in your water. You put the straw in the water, you suck it up, and it filters it. Um, in the 1990s, there was something called a Brita filter. It was very similar to that concept. Better than nothing at all, right? Um, understand if the water that you have, what could be in your water, right? Is there, you know, and I guess in his case, it'd be, are there dingoes up the road peeing in the water, right? In North America, are there bears and moose and stuff peeing in the water? Who knows, right? So this is something you always have to always have to look at and consider. Consider the source of your water. 
we when you go out into the woods it's important to know your way back and we talk about articles time and time and time again uh, where people go out into the woods they are either ill prepared not prepared at all or just and they just end up, you know, either getting badly injured, lost, or worse yet, dying. Uh, a few years ago, we talked about a young lady. Her name was Anu Kelly, and she walked off into the wilderness, uh, and she went completely naked as part of a spiritual quest. And unfortunately, she went missing, and she never, ever was seen from again. And that's a very terrible, uh, terrible thing to have happen. No one ever knew what even happened to her. And uh, that's just one of those unfortunate things in life um, that she never, never did get found. Her body was never found, uh, you know, and, 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 and that was it. So you always have to watch yourself out there. Of course, um, nature doesn't care about you. It doesn't care if you live. It doesn't care if you die. But it does give you the opportunity to save yourself if you know how. So always be prepared. So Bob Cooper, the person who um, consulted with this article, says if you're going to go out into the woods, he's got a list here of key survival items. So make sure you've got water bottles with you. Make sure, like, you know, if you have the new, the fancy new water bladders, so you've got a three-liter water bladder on your back, uh, the old hip canteen, whatever works, L uh, you know, even a standard water bottle. But make sure you have at least three liters of water with you, so if you anything happens, you have extra water, right? Uh, you could carry water purification tablets. Again, depending on where you are in the world, something to consider. So if you get water, you can purify the water. Make sure you get a rescue blanket. It's one of the things he talks about is one of those blaze orange rescue blankets with a silver on the outside. Again, natural shelters are great. Building a natural shelter is great. But what if you're lost and you're trying to be found, right? If you're trying to be found, visibility is super, super important. And we talked about this in previous episodes for dogs and stuff, is that if you have blaze orange equipment on you or the access to it, you can use that in order to... Uh, in order to find visibility. For example, if you have a blaze orange backpack cover that you have stowed in your pack, again, you can get those off, uh, you know, your favorite discount website like eBay or AliExpress or whatever for a dollar. It doesn't matter that it's not the best quality in the world. It could save your life. So you have this thing packed in your backpack. It now has multiple, multiple uses. Backpack cover looks like it's basically a ginormous shopping bag Right? So, if it truly is waterproof, you could move water with it. You can put it on your backpack to give you the visibility that you need. You could put it over your head uh, a little bit, you know, over your over the top of your head and over your shoulders as a bit of a rain or a sun shield. You could wrap it around a tree um, for visibility if you get lost. All sorts of good things. So, it's super, super important that if you want to be found, you can be found. Um... Again, you can get the ones that have like the silvery stuff on them, the aluminized mylar. That mylar, also very good to help you get found. Super, super important stuff. Carry a basic first aid kit. Again, nothing worse than going out into the woods and getting cut, dinged, walking, you know, if you're wearing shorts or whatever, um, you know, or sandals, um, you know, and you get and you walk into something sharp, you're going to get cut and have a great ability to, um, to save yourself if you've got a first aid kit. Plus, inside first aid kits, there's always things that you can use for other purposes. For example, if you're stable and you are creating a fire and it's wet outside, you can open up your first aid kit and inside there you will find stuff that burns. Cotton bandages, uh, cotton pads, all sorts of stuff. Just a warning with that to what we call use common sense to ensure that if you're using your first aid kit, don't use stuff that you could use later and you burnt it. So be sparing with it. Uh, Bob Cooper recommends that you have two methods of starting a fire, such as a cigarette lighter and matches. When I go out for any kind of hikes, I make sure I have three methods of starting a fire on me at all times. Three methods. So you're going to carry a ferro rod. I'm going to carry a lighter. I'm going to carry matches. Three methods of starting a fire. He said have a mirror. Good for signaling, right? We have sometimes 
Um, people die, uh, you know, either die or get stranded, and they see search planes going overhead. They could have signaled with the mirror. The other thing, the old uh, the old search and rescue CEO used to tell me is you have a mirror when on your expeditions so you can see who's lost. The other thing is a whistle. Super important to have a whistle. Uh, we talk about this a lot. You can get either you know a more deluxe Fox 40 made in Canada version. You can get cheaper P versions. It doesn't matter. Get them at the dollar store. Put it on your zipper or on your backpack so you always have it. Because again, if I'm down and I'm yelling... I'm only going to yell so long before my voice gets sore and I can't do it anymore. Then I have to, uh, you know, try to make noise another way. But with a whistle, saves a lot. Whistle is a fantastic tool. So if you carry those simple items, you will ensure that you're going to be found. Again, you don't want to end up, you know, lost or injured or shot or any number of things. So if you're going out into the woods and you're not doing photographic work or anything like that, you want to make sure that you can be seen. Again, like we talk a lot of times, there's no no shame or, or upset in, in wearing the camouflage if you want to blend in a little bit with the wilderness and you're going, you know, tracking and, and you're listening to bird song and, and doing that kind of ID. But if you're going out for a hike for a few days, have the ability with you to make sure that if you need to be seen or heard, you can do both. So again, he just has a few things here. Bob Cooper's survival items, three liters of water for each day, water tablets for purification, rescue blanket, basic first aid kit, two methods to start a fire, a mirror, and a whistle. And that's true. If you got all that stuff in a little fanny pack or whatever it is you want to use, uh, you're certainly going to help yourself. That's a, a really great system that he has in place for that. So with that, we are going to move on to our next segment. Tips and tricks. In the tips and tricks section today, we are going to talk about a highly, highly um, controversial part of the bushcraft community. Everybody agrees they're awesome, but... Not everybody agrees on how they're used or the different brand names, all kinds of stuff like that. So we're going to talk about, of course, the one, the only, the ferrocerium rod. So we'll start out here by looking up ferrocerium on our trusty Wikipedia. Ferrocerium is described as a synthetic pyrophoric alloy that produces hot sparks that can reach temperatures of 3,000 degrees Celsius or 5,430 degrees Fahrenheit when it rapidly oxidizes by the process of striking. So the properties allow it to have many commercial applications, such as ignition sources for lighters, which is unfortunately uh, mislabeled as flint, strikers for gas and welding torches, deoxidization systems in metallurgy, ferrocerium rods, also called ferro rods, um, are, all, are, wrongly, are wrongly marketed as flint and steel. This is the name for uh, a different type of lighter using a section of carbon steel and natural flint. So if you go into like your, your local outdoor store and you say, where's your flint and steel? They'll give you a ferrocerium rod. Again, flint is flint. It's a rock. It's like flint stone, flint rock. And steel is a usually a piece of high carbon steel that you'll whack it with to get sparks coming out of it. So please note that ferrocerium or a ferro rod is completely different than flint and steel. Due to ferrocerium's ability to ignite in adverse condition, rods of ferrocerium are often used as emergency combustionable devices in survival kits. So let's go on here a little bit about the history of ferrocerium, which I find really fascinating. Some people say that ferrocerium is primitive or it is a uh, like a primitive fire starting method. It really isn't primitive at all. Ferrocerium was invented in 1903 by an Austrian chemist by the name of Karl Auer von Welsbach. It takes its name from the two primary components, iron, also known as ferros or ferro, um, which is Latin for iron, and the rare earth element cerium. The pyrophoric effect is dependent on the brittleness of the alloy and its low auto-ignition temperatures. So you'll often talk about something called miche metals that are mixed in with the ferro or with the iron and the cerium 
So the mesh metals change the effect of the material. So basically what that means is some to put to call make it very very simple you get good ferro rods and you get not good ferro rods crappy ferro rods that don't work very well the mesh metal are additional metals that they add into the metal into the ferrocerium in order to make it work better we'll get into that in a little bit so wikipedia goes on to say while ferrocerium and steels function in a similar way to natural flint and steel ferrocerium takes on a role that steel played in the traditional methods small shavings of the ferrocerium are quickly removed enough that the heat generated by the friction of that removal ignites the shavings and converts the metal into oxide the sparks are tiny pieces of burning metal do the uh, the sparking is due to cerium's low ignition temperature between 150 and 180 degrees celsius or 302 degrees fahrenheit about 700 tons of ferrocerium were produced in the year 2000 my suspicion is that since bushcraft and outdoor survival and all this stuff has increased in in um in society in the mind of society especially western societies we probably are at three to four times that so if we compare uh, ferrocerium to natural flint ferrocerium bears no chemical res res relationship to flint rock plain and simple the similarity lies in the fact that both materials are historically used to generate sparks traditional flint and steel fire starting systems using natural flint rock and an iron rock or iron rod has a resemblance to ferrocerium as it is the iron of the tiny shards that produces the striking process that burns so that's it again i don't know what happened in the minds of the public that it's sort of some weird bizarro crossover but flint and steel is not a ferro rod although the terms unfortunately are used interchangeably so let's talk a little bit about flint spark lighters so a sp flint spark lighter or a lighter, as most people call it, is a type of lighter used in many applications to safely light gaseous fuels to start a flame. So for like Bunsen burners and things like that. So it's a flint spark lighter. They are, they're like a little puck and you flick it and it will, all kinds of sparks will come out. They use them for like lighting welling torches and stuff like that. So uh, uh, the flint spark lighter works by rapidly rubbing a small piece of ferrocerium on a sharp edge of a substance that's harder than the rod. However, carbon steel works better than most materials the same way flint and steel are used. So again, there's your comparison between flint and steel. The carbon steel gets you a better spark. The manual rubbing action is uh, done by squeezing the handle and it will create a spark which will ignite a gaseous fuel. As a tinder igniting campfire, starter rods are sold under various trade names like Fire Steel, Blast Match, uh, Metal Match. I know there's a Bear Grylls one uh, that uh, you know people on, in the outdoor industry will use. Some manufacturers and resellers uh, will sometimes even call them a magnesium rod. However, these manufacturers don't usually have magnesium in their ferro rods. What they will sometimes do is they will take a chunk of magnesium, a little rectangle of magnesium, and they will stick on a ferrocerium rod into the magnesium. So basically what you do is you take your, um, you take your striker and you shave off a pile, a good pile of the magnesium specks, and then you fire your ferro rod into it, and that will light even if it's wet outside. So that's really kind of an important thing. So if you take the magnesium um, and you mix it and, and you get the shavings and then you throw the ferro spark into it, it's going to ignite. So the, the composition of a ferro rod, again, as we said, is ferrocerium, which is iron and um, iron and cerium, right? It's a new material out there, relatively speaking. It was discovered in, in 1903. How long ago was flint and actual flint and steel discovered? Long time before that. Um, again, you know, look at uh, things like the the bow drill and the hand drill. Long time before 1903, right? So, uh, in Europe, uh, ferro rods are sometimes called otter metal, or I'm sorry, our metal, uh, after the uh, inventor Baron Karl Auer von Welsbach. Uh, the three different hour metals were developed. Again, there's iron and cerium. The second is lan is lanthanum uh, to produce brighter sparks. 
And the third is added other heavy metals. Again, that's what we call niche metals. In Baron von Wellsbach's first alloy, he had 30% iron, and then the rest was cerium, hence the ferrocerium. The modern ferrocerium uh, products are usually composed of uh, different alloys um, and more rare earth metals. Sometimes they will have 20.8% uh, iron, 41% cerium. So again, you're still dominating dominating uh, by the cerium in the material. And about 4% 4 4 of other materials, right? Uh, all kinds of strange things, including sometimes magnesium. But they'll have all kinds of other weird stuff. And there's stuff you can't pronounce, um, you know. Uh, but you can certainly look up. And every manufacturer, of course, is different. Uh, and they'll often be hardened with iron oxide and magnesium oxide. So that's, that's basically the uh, the Wikipedia article on ferrocerium. Kind of an important thing to know when you're going out there. Now, the weird thing about these ferro rods that a lot of people don't know is that they, they come from the factory with a coating on them, very similar to a gun bluing coating. Now, I know there's a, um, a couple of people who are making exotic coatings for them, so they're like gold or pink or whatever but it's basically a coating. So there's a couple of reasons for that. And again, in the bushcraft industry, there's a lot of people who will always tell you, no matter what your opinion is, you're wrong. But I contacted some of these um, on behalf of Barefoot Bushcraft, and I asked them why they have the coating. And they said that there's usually two reasons. The first reason is the coating prevents ignition. So if you can imagine these devices, these ferrocerium rods, stored in a truck, right? So you've got maybe a 100,000, maybe even more of these ferro rods packed in a truck, um, in a box. What happens when that truck gets banged around, flips over, goes into a ditch, any number of strange things? All those ferro rods are going to clang together and they could ignite, right? So you can have premature ignition. So they're going to bang and they're going to clang and they're going to set off and that could cause a massive, massive, you know, television quality explosion i would guess who knows so that's the first reason the second reason that they have a coating on uh, and this was really remarkable is that ferro rods degrade if you have a ferro rod in a salt water environment so let's say you're near the ocean um, your ferro rod will degrade if you have a ferro rod necklace so you wear it around your neck, uh, you know, and I have seen people get them cool designs, uh, pentagrams and crosses and all kinds of cool stuff like that made out of ferrocerium. Um, if you wear it around your neck, the sweat from your body, the heat, the moisture will also degrade the ferrocerium. It will look like a piece of coral. Now, I have seen this. Personally, I have seen this. So you will see the ferrocerium start to go into kind of a, uh, like a, a, a powdery, it like almost like a sulfur color, so a yellow powder color. And then you will see it start to develop holes. So for long term, 20, 40, 30, 50 years, you probably will be very careful in making sure that the ferro rod keeps the coating on it. If you buy these things and you just chuck them in a drawer, they are not going to last forever. They will most likely last your lifetime, but they will not last forever. So that's something to always be concerned and be understanding about with the ferro rods. Now you can get all kinds of cool, innovative products that have ferro serum rods in them for emergency purposes. Um, so that would be things like, uh, you know, little clips or, or things like that that would go on your um, on your equipment. So the lobster clasps, I think that they're called. So for belts. Um, you know, for like your backpack. So you have one on your backpack and you can have one on your belt. You can get, again, ferro rod jewelry. So you can get, uh, like I said, I've seen uh, crosses and pentagrams and all sorts of stuff. So you can have them for that. What we do here at Barefoot Bushcraft, we buy them right from the manufacturer in China. We have them shipped over and then we assemble them here. So we take the, a very large, high quality with a very nice niche metal in them so that you get a significant amount of spark. Uh, we create Canadian maple handles for them and then we use a striker. Now the strikers themselves are constantly a form of, um, uh, of argument in the bushcraft community. 
uh, a lot of times you will get a very good quality ferrocerium rod and a very poor quality striker and the two will get confused people will say oh this rod is a piece of garbage it's no good blah 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 when the reality is it's not actually the rod that's the problem it's the striker ideally again the article that we talked about on wikipedia also states this you would probably want to use the best quality of carbon steel and there's something about the high carbon content of the steel that you just get a better drag you get a better spark from it and that's very important so you we use hacksaw blades right they're inexpensive they are pennies on the dollar right i think it's like we buy six of them for three dollars then we cut them to length and we put them on the ferro rod so with our ferro rods and again anybody can do this we take a piece of wooden dowel we drill a hole in it and we shove the ferro rod in it with some epoxy and then now you have a piece of wood on the handle so now you have a potential for an ignition source even if it's dry even if it's really horrible weather or wet whatever you can actually take the handle of the ferro rod you can scrape some of the wood shavings off of it for yourself the um uh, blade itself is a hacksaw blade means you can cut stuff with it right so you have a hacksaw blade you got wood uh, a wooden handle on it and of course you have the ferro rod itself so that's something that you definitely uh, want to have in your kit they're inexpensive right we sell ours um for like uh, for ten dollars twenty dollars i think with worldwide shipping you can buy them at most of your local outdoor stores again they vary in cost from you know pennies each to fifty dollars depending on size and and quality um, so i would recommend that you should have one of those in your kit at all times uh, you know many of people have what's called the edc or everyday carry have a ferro rod as part of your everyday carry just like the whistle on your jacket could save your life someday right if this gentleman had had um you know if, if he'd gone out into the woods and he'd had a ferro rod he would have been able to start a fire right and then uh he probably you know mr Askui there wouldn't have ended up in the news he'd have been just like most people you go out into the woods you have a good time you go home see your family write about it blog about it instagram it so we don't want to see any of our listeners out in that position so that gives you some information about the ferrocerium rod so i want to uh thank you for listening to that and now we are going to go into our next segment after our special break and we are going to talk to an amazing guy a canadian person of course we try to get canadians on the show as much as possible being as we are uh, assembled in canada canadian man loves dogs passionate awesome dog owner and he is going on an amazing journey he is mushing his sled dogs from manitoba all the way to new brunswick a distance of three thousand kilometers so he is on the first leg of his journey we caught up with him uh to do this podcast we will hear again from him when he's finished his expedition uh, and we'll do some debrief with that awesome guy so um i hope you guys enjoy that and after this we'll be right back Hi, I'm Robert Suter from Survival Central Limited. Check out our two great prepper survival websites. For the beginner, survivalcentral.ca, and for the advanced, more extreme prepper, prepperextreme.com. Be prepared, stay safe, and survive. We would love to hear from you. If you have any comments or suggestions or anything you'd like to say about the show or on the show, please get in touch with us. You can call us, leave a voicemail at 866 866- Two four eight one three six two extension three zero zero. Tweet us at BF Bushcraft. Send us a message on our Barefoot Bushcraft Facebook page, or of course you can even send us a picture on Instagram. Um, and we are of course Barefoot Bushcraft. So please, we'd always love to hear from our listeners. Get in touch with us any way you can, and we will play your information on the air. Thank you. All right, and we're back for the second half of the Barefoot Bushcraft radio show. And today we have a special guest, Canadian Justin Allen, on the show. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much. So, Justin, you are involved in a really amazing and truly Canadian project. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're currently working on? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I'm from the east coast of Canada, uh, New Brunswick originally, 
And uh, six years ago, I moved uh, to central north northern Manitoba, a place called Churchill, where I discovered uh, dog sledding, and I fell in love with the dogs, the uh, in, in the whole lifestyle of it, and actually, I've been—that's what I did ever since. I pretty much gave up my whole life and stayed there and to raise dogs and, and, and partake in this uh, ancient uh, culture of dog mushing. That's really cool. Now, myself, I'm a an amateur musher. I don't have as many dogs as you. I have just uh, four dogs, and one is actually a foster dog. Um, nice. So, so tell us what got you into into the sport of mushing. Like, what was appealing to it, other than, of course, a passion for dogs. Yeah, well, I, was, I think it's just the whole lifestyle. I like the physicalness of it. You know, the routine, the responsibility. You know, and, and then I think you know it's also just the, like you said, the dogs themselves. I mean, they're very special, and you know, you can just see the drive that they have, and you can just see you know you love their spirit, and that just drew me to uh, you know to want to work with them and stay with them and. And I think, too, also, it's just the nature of, you know, what we do, being outside and, you know, battling the elements, you know, sort of becoming one with nature. It's just, you know, it's like the feeling you just can't explain and you just, I can't, can't let it go. That's really awesome uh, that, that, that you have that much passion for them. Now, of course, uh, you know, and please don't, uh, don't think that I'm on the anti side, but there's a lot, there's a loud and ever-growing voice that mushing is cruel um, yeah, you know, I, I'm sure you have something to speak to the people who have some, unfortunately, negative things to say about that. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I, first, I agree, right? Like, let's let you can't deny that there are people out there that have dogs that mistreat them, and that shouldn't have dogs. You know, I think that applies to all aspects of life. Um, as a as a guy who really loves his dogs and does everything you know I can for my dogs, you know it sucks to be put in a box and be told that you know what I do is cruel and that I you know I mean that my dogs you know are are abused you know it's just so far from the truth, um, which is exactly why you know one of the reasons I was driven to do the big expedition that we're currently you know doing, which is traveling across Canada's north from Churchill all the way back to New Brunswick. And we were going to be stopping in communities and uh, along the way and, and showing dog setting from a positive perspective. Um, negative, negative, you know, attention and energy travels fast. People love to talk and about, you know, the bad things. Um, so we just want to really, you know, just pour all our energy and our focus into the positive. And we want to show people that these dogs are loved that they're definitely happy and willing and like they want to do this like i don't make my dogs run i make my dogs stop you know that's that's the thing that these these guys want to do it if you had a retriever and you threw a ball and it went and got it like did you make that dog do that no it's the design it's what's in them you know it's like it's what they're bred to do these are our dogs are bred to run they're bred to pull and so uh you know i just want to invite people like if you you know, see something on Facebook or you hear these stories of, you know, abusing kennels. Like, yeah, I get it, like I said. But you can't put everyone in a box, you know. I'd urge people to go check out some kennels and, and see for themselves because there's definitely lots of people out there that are really upset with this too. Like, as a musher, I, it's so frustrating. Like, I, I you know, you, you hate it because, you know, I, it it taints my, my you know, people have this, you know, when you say it, they get this kind of weird look, you know, they... And it sucks because there's so much love and there's so much respect that, you know, that goes into this for me. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I just, I would just urge people to, you know, to maybe keep a bit of an open, open mind that it's not, it's not always like, you know, what people, what you see on Facebook is not always the truth. Uh, you know, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, there's some um, anthropological articles that have come out recently uh, from areas of Siberia where mushing dogs originated, the northern breeds, and it yep. said that they found out that these dogs, our brand of dog, the husky brand, has been around pulling dogs or pulling humans and freight between nine and 11,000 years. That is, yeah. that is a significant amount of time. More time. That than, is, I mean, that's more. That's that is more than double, or probably three times longer than any other animal that people have worked with ever. It is the oldest relationship between man and animal is the dog. 
and you know and that's also is exactly why we're doing these northern communities because i'm traveling to to meet with the first nations people because these are the people it's in their blood you know that's the people that have that that this relationship derived from and then open this whole continent up was from you know dogs and the people of, of you know the first nations people so that's what we're you know we're traveling to celebrate and to you know pay tribute and and you know basically just to pay our respects and, and say thank you you know just to acknowledge that you know this is where it comes from so this journey is going to take you probably, you know, a few weeks or months. What what inspired you to do this other than your drive to go back out east, drive to go home? Yeah. Um, you know, well, like, we basically pretty much it was what we've been talking about, you know. I feel like I was in a position in my life to, you know, do something like this. And, and, and I it just felt a calling, you know. I wanted to raise awareness for the positive um, sides of the sport. I wanted to promote the healthy and active living, and I wanted to, you know, like when we get back to New Brunswick, I'm going to have a program for anyone who adopts a dog. If you adopt a dog, you know, anywhere in New Brunswick, I'm going to offer all my services to you and your dog free of charge. You know, come. You can. I'll teach you how to work with your dog, and you can, you know, interact with my dog, socialize, and build a relationship because the bond that. The bond that's formed when when you start working with your dog, it's just incredible, and I want people to to know that that exists, and we want to spread that love, and you know, so that's you know one major reason, and and again, it's the history, you know. I'm very passionate about you know where this comes from, and I want people, I want it to be acknowledged, you know. I want people that to to re recognize it, and and, and you know. It, I feel like it's it has no right. The dogs deserve much more uh, respect, and they deserve you know more credit than than they're than they're being given right now. I I couldn't agree more with that for sure, and I think it's a it's a wonderful way to bring attention to both the breed and some of our First Nations communities. You know, I know there's a whole lot we don't really talk about politics on the show, but there's a whole lot of political stuff going on in First Nations communities. You know that they they need a lot mm-hmm. of uh, you know they they could use a lot of assistance, and I think this is great uh, the journey that you're doing. So, are you going to be like broadcasting this into classrooms or podcasts and things to help raise awareness when you're done? Um, yeah, well, we're going to be, basically, we're going to the schools, we're talking to the kids, you know, we're meeting with elders, and we're sharing stories, and, you know, sort of gathering some, some, some of that, you know, old knowledge, you know, that people still carry. Um, yeah, we're going to try to do a couple podcasts once we get farther south. This first couple weeks is going to be a bit tough, you know, there's not much reception in, in a lot of these communities, and, you know, but, you know, we're just, all we're trying to do is just be a positive light, we're, you know, we're we're not going through here focusing on a lot more issues. We just want to give a positive, you know, charge, you know, go through and, and just be a little beacon of light, you know, happiness. Uh, that That's our real goal with this. We, we, we want to just focus everything on, on the good. That's really, really, really cool. So now how many dogs do you have in your care right now? We have 12. That's cool. So do your dogs yeah. live in your house with you? Like I have five. And right now yeah. when I look around my office here that we're broadcasting from, I have, they're, they're laying all over the place on my couch <laughs> and all over. So are your guys like with you all the time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we, we do have house time, you know, and cabin time, but more, they, but they, they like it outside. They sleep outside. Uh, they each have their own little houses and their own little spots right now. When we're on the road, I've got a nice big box in my truck that has different compartments and they each have their own compartment uh, with, with uh, shared, shared air between all of them. So they share the heat. It's all insulated. Um, so they're, you know, they're good like that. Um, they don't really like it inside them, you know, to be honest. And, and, and it's always funny because people, you know, they don't until you see it, but I've brought my dogs in with, uh, with guests and friends of mine before. And then probably 15, 20 minutes into being inside they're you know, they're scratching at the door and they're panting, you know, they, these dogs love to be outside. Um, they love to be stimulated by the lunar cycle, you know, by the stars, by the weather, by the wind, by the scent of other animals, the trees, the you know, the bugs. Like, this is what they 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 love that. I mean, I love that. Uh, so you know, some I kind of look at it like a house is just kind of like a giant kennel. It's still four walls and a roof. Yeah, absolutely, and I I agree. All, all of my huskies, but one prefer to be outside. And if they could, just like your guys, they would live twenty four seven outside. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think when people believe that that is inappropriate behavior for that brand of dog, I think that's just naive. Um, you know, well, and I, and exactly. I'm with you on that. that. I think it's just a lack of education. It's a misunderstanding, and it's a bit of like humanizing. Like, I, you know, I see it a lot when you know I worked. My dogs grew up in a tourist. Uh, yard you know a kennel that runs a lot of tours up in churchill and you know people come to go for rides and it's more of an educational program you know it's uh, just a taste of the actual run itself is pretty small it's just a taste but there's you know a good hour and a half educational program that people get to get to know i think that's the biggest thing like these dogs are designed for that you know we, we other there's like, we wouldn't go around and start rounding up all the wild animals you know uh and put them inside just because we feel cold I mean, these dogs, you know, they're built for this. But, again, let's get back. Like, there's a line. Like, I get it. I'm not just leaving them out there in the elements. Like, I'm providing, you know, bedding for them to get off the ground. I'm providing a windbreak for them. I have top-of-the-line jackets, two sets of them that I can put on my dogs to help insulate them. I stay up all night, and I build dog yards for them. The other night, we pulled into the school at Fox Lake, and the wind started coming up, and the dogs were kind of exposed. So, me and my crew spent four hours shoveling snow and building walls to protect them from the wind. And we put down so much straw, like the dogs, you know, I, we work our butts off for these dogs. Like it's not, you know, they're tough, but we, you know, I'm not just leaving them out there, you know, with no attention, you know, we are very attentive to them and we make sure that they're always comfortable. So you speak of a crew. So are you doing this solo, like just you and your dogs and your dog and your sled bag, or are, or do you have support with you? Yeah, I've got some support with me. Um, I have. Well, in this leg, I had three people that were co- that came with me. So I have two people that are full time in my truck, and then I have one person off and on that's running a snow machine, carrying supplies with me on the trail where I'm not able to have my truck anywhere nearby. So I always have support always have you know enough supplies with me um you know we're we're, we're, we've spent a lot of time preparing for this to make sure that we you know because with the land that we're traveling is not easy you know so we want to be prepared for for everything so now tell us a little bit about more uh from the technical aspect obviously this took significant amount of time to plan the routes and everything else i see you're using a you're using a spot unit to track yourself so how did you go about doing all the technical planning Oh, man, that's the hardest part of this whole thing. You know, as a dog guy, I just want to be out there running my dogs. <laughs> Working a computer and sending emails and doing all this is, is uh, it's crazy. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've had a, a friend of mine, um, a close friend from the East Coast, who's uh, really stepped up. Um, and he's, along with my, my girlfriend, have been really key in that you know um, contacting communities and and you know and doing online shopping and sourcing and pricing and um looking online for planning the route and you know it, just a bit by bit though i mean this is two years we've been working on this before we left we started our first you know planning a long time ago so i think it's just a matter of dedic- dedicating a little bit of time every day you know like we just set a schedule and said okay this has to be done, then we do this, and just bit by bit by bit, we just chipped away, which is exactly the way I'm looking at this run that I'm doing. Section by section, run by run, day by day, hour by hour, we're just looking, we're not looking too far ahead, we're just dealing with what we're doing, you know, bit by bit. And, and I think that's how, you know, we speak to many adventurers like yourself on the show, and that's how a lot of people see it. Uh, in 2009, I hiked the Bruce Trail, which runs in Ontario. It's about 1,000 kilometers, and it was the same. It was like, plan this as you're doing 810 kilometer day hikes, right? So you're doing yeah, like 80 day hikes. That's right. And break yeah. it all down into little bits. That's the only way to comprehend it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Otherwise, it gets a little overwhelming. And to be honest, I've definitely had those moments, like laying in bed, where it's just like all of a sudden everything just rushes on me. I'm like, holy, like, what am I doing? Uh, Yeah, like, you can't let that, you know. And I guess the thing for me, too, is it's just a positive energy. You know, I believe in sort of, you know, that the manifestation or like what you what you put out, you get back. And so we've just constantly since day one, just like we don't see problems. I just see solutions you know like if something happens okay well what can we do to fix it we're not hyper focusing and getting ourselves down it's just constant positive positive and putting it out there and we're and you know what it's, it's been amazing everything's been working out perfect and obviously there's been hiccups and it's been it's tough of course but 
you know, be stupid. I knew I was, I knew what I was doing. I knew what I'm getting myself into. I knew, I know that during this trip, I'm going to be, you know, cold, uncomfortable. I'm going to get hurt. I know, I know I'm going to, you know, suffer. It's just, uh, you know, being mentally prepared for that and accepting it. And then just, you know, there's just constantly, the only thing that's in your mind is just the next step, overcome the next step, overcome. We just do that enough. We're going to see New Brunswick. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that that sounds like it's it's going to be awesome. So tell me about your sled. Now, there's all different types of sleds that mushers use, from traditional mm, yeah. ones made out of sinew and oak to modern aluminum ones. Yeah, I got well. I have three sleds with me on this trip. Um, <clears throat> one is a really lightweight. It's made of like uh, white ash. Uh, it's like a racing sled. You know, it's it's handcrafted. It's wood uh, with sinew tie and all that. That one I'm, pro I'm not using a whole lot. That's kind of like just my emergency backup one. It's one that I like to take when I go racing with my dogs. Um, so, and then I also have a touring sled. So I got a nice big heavy one that's a dual seater so I can take two people sitting down comfortably with me on the sled. Uh, I'm bringing that because we also have a cameraman. We're doing a, making, there's a production company out of the East Coast that's making a documentary on this. So at times we're going to have a guy on the sled I wanted to also have it in the communities, um, you know, maybe give some rides to some of the kids and some of the elders that haven't been on dog sleds since they were, you know, child. So, you know, we, we wanted to have that option as well. But the main one I'm using is uh, it's just a cheap one. It's made of Teflon and aluminum, you know. It's just light, but it's simple design. It's just only got two stanchions, one up, like one straight up, and then one down into like a 45. <coughs> um, it's toboggan style real thick Teflon runners, you know, it's basically just made to get beat up and it's easy to fix. Uh, and I made it pretty big, you know, the bag on it, it's a, about five and a half, six feet long almost. So, uh, I can carry lots of stuff. I can get, you know, all my jackets and booties and all my food and my, my sleeping bag and my tent, like we can, we can fill her up and, you know, and, and be able, be able to get going and stay out in the bush for, you know, probably at least four or five days. That's cool. Um, so now you you know obviously you're going to be out in the bush you're going to be out in the wilderness so you had to either previously have them or learn them about some of your like wilderness skills so did you uh, what sort of skills did you put in your own personal toolkit uh, you know fire starting and all that stuff to be able to deal with any things that happen uh, yeah I mean honestly I think I'll, there's a lot of hands on stuff you know like as a kid you know I like growing up in the woods I played in the woods I like fires and you know all this stuff, I, I you know, I, I always like the survival stuff. I mean, honestly, I got a couple, I think it's just, me, the biggest thing is a frame of mind, honestly. Like, you can, you can, there's lots of resources around if you're aware and conscious, you know, only thinking in, in it and gonna see what's available, at, at, you know, to use. So, I guess, like, as far as survival stuff, I make sure I got my, you know, I got a real nice knife, I got a real good axe, and and I got a fire starter and, you know, the right proper clothing is also super important. I mean, as far as actually like survival skills, I don't, I mean, it, every, every time I, I set up camp, it's different. You know, every situation is different. And, and again, like I just said, it's, I think it's just about being, you know, having the mental, the mental knowledge to sort of look around and, and, and be creative. You know, you have to adapt and you have to use what, you know, is around you. And we find that a lot with uh, with adventurers like yourself, where when you ask them to talk about their skills, it's like yourself, where you don't really consider it a skill; it's just how you live. <laughs> These are yeah, well, yeah, yeah, tying exactly. your shoes. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just I, I don't. Yeah, I wouldn't even view it as a skill, really. Like you said, it's just kind of like, oh well, that's just what I you do. You just get used to looking for this, and you get used to seeing that, and you know, you start to yeah, it just becomes it just becomes a way of thinking. Um, yeah. So, now, of course, you know, the dogs, for the most part, are okay running around naked out with just a collar and harness on. You're not. Um, You're right, yeah. So, <laughs> what kind of clothing and how did you prepare for the, you know, what kind of temperature ranges are you looking at and, and how are you preparing for that? Uh, I'm, I'm, looking at my, I'm looking at the coldest you can get, <laughs> aside from, you know, we're, I'm prepared for 60 below, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, uh, I use a lot of wool, to be honest. Uh, I like I like just good old fashioned wool. Uh, I feel like it's sometimes 
you know, the merino wool is nice. Any, I, I don't like anything less than sort of generally as a general rule. It's like eighty five percent wool and up is everything I'm looking for. Uh, you know, a because this sport, um, I'm heating and I'm cooling. Uh, you know, I'm sweating and I'm cooling. I could be just sitting on the back of that sled doing nothing, but riding a drag mat holding them back. But then I could just turn around in one minute and have to run up a hill for 25 minutes. Like, so I like wool because you know it keeps even when it gets damp, it keeps me keeps me dry. Uh, I do have some down stuff. I usually I got a few, I got a couple of dry bags uh, with a stuff pack full of some extra down layers because they don't last very long once you start sweating. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much. Yeah, I like well, I like wool. That's <laughs> that's my thing. Cool. So do you have like the usual Canada goose jacket or are you wearing something else for an outer shell? Oh yeah, no, I got the Canada goose jacket. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> although I am exploring other options, uh, it's just, I can't, I can't deny that the jackets are warm, but I, uh, I also, you know, they're, uh, it's, they're, it's big jackets, you know, they're a bit bulky at times, but, uh, there's a company actually it's called a ninja suit i've been showing people this a lot they really like it found it a few years back uh i think it was made somewhere in in vancouver or something but by a bunch of guys like extreme skiers or snowboarders mountain mountain guys um the uh it's just, just a one-piece onesie it's like a second skin you know it's mine's 99 percent marina wool one percent spandex and that's life-changing that thing uh, it's a body regulation suit. It's amazing. So I don't know, ninja suit. If anyone out there is, you know, out there hiking and sweating and cooling down, it's it's a really nice piece of uh, piece of clothing. That's for sure. That's really cool. And that's something that you use on a regular basis out there. Um, yeah, if I'm going overnight, that's what I'm using. Uh, I'm, you know, day trips, I got some other stuff. But if I'm going camping and I know I'm going to be out for two or three days or you know up to a week. I could just leave that suit right on the whole time. You know, it wicks everything away, and it just insulates your body. I could just change a couple outer layers, but that that thing, uh, you know, it's it's kept me warm and dry. I'll tell you a little story about that. I went out when it was 35 below Celsius, and we're out coming home from a long run, and something happened, and we got one of the dogs got tangled, and I, um, these are not my dogs that I'm running right now, but a couple years back, just running some other dogs before I had my own team. Anyway, there's a big fight broke out, and so I'm out there, and I'm fighting and wrestling dogs and breaking it up and trying to sort it out, you know, and I'm, it's battle. Like, you, like, you're going to war right away, you know, these dogs will really hurt each other, and you, if you're not, you know, I mean, I've definitely gotten bit many a times, but I was sweating, soaked, dripping in sweat, and it's 30, you know, 31 or 2 below or something, uh, and I still had three hours on the dog team to get home. I got home, and... The, I had two layers <laughs> in between my thermal layer that I was wearing that ninja suit and my outside layer frozen stiff when I got there. But that when I peeled that suit off, it was like peeling off a warm, wet blanket. Like that thing saved my life that night for sure. I mean, well, or it definitely kept me from really like being painfully having some really, you know, I would have got hypothermic. Like I would have, it would have been bad if I didn't have that sort of layer. So I think, you know, that's definitely key for, you know, for me in terms of like a survival aspect is having that kind of clothing available to me uh it could definitely change you know save your life if, if you know she got hairy wow so of course you know in part of all the couple of years that you've been planning this you've planned and um, you know as you say you've experienced many dangers and situations that you know can get to can go south very quickly so what kind of dangers are you perceiving that you're going to and challenges you're going to face on this expedition oh uh, wow uh well i guess for me a big thing is the dogs uh you know uh, we did a lot of training for control for my team i think that's the biggest thing you know to be able to stop when we need to stop and be able to move over to the left or the right you know to have my leaders you know really know and really you know listen to me i think that that for me is, is a huge thing um you know, and because otherwise they're going to, you know, we can end up running through some stuff and getting hurt, right? And the dogs, you know, my, if I, that's one of my big fears. Like if I run into some, you know, get into some troubled stuff, you know, I don't want to hurt a dog. So I'm always being able to like set myself up and set them up and not putting them in a position that I would, you know, they would get hurt. 
is super important for me. Um, but in then in the, in the, with saying that, it's then you know having to bunker down. So then if I got to make camp or if I got to stop and survive somewhere for three days, you know, and I got to you know whatever like that's I think the biggest thing is being equipped to bunker down. Uh, if the weather moves in, if we lose a trail, if, you know, something happens, we need to be able to just stay calm, relax, no one freaks out, you know, we just build a camp, settle down, regather ourselves, deal with our issues, uh, water, like I just said, but it's the same thing, you know, if I fall through the water, or if I get wet, or my dogs get wet, you know, okay, well, we got to stop, we got to set up camp, we got to dry ourselves off, you just have, you know, have, being, having this stuff available to deal with the situation, that's the thing, that, uh, it's basically just, yeah, being being prepared to, to change your, you know, stop and set up camp. Like, if you don't have it, I got a couple of general rules. If you don't have it, you can't use it. So, you know, that's kind of the thing. And, and it's always just slow and steady being methodical uh, and redundant when it comes to having extra mitts and extra gloves and, you know, having extra insoles. Like, I always have extra clothes with me. I always have extra stuff for the dogs, you know. And I think, you know, being prepared that way is important because I'd rather have it and not, not need it than need it and not have it. Yeah, that's a really fantastic philosophy. Um, I know for us, like when we teach school stuff, we always teach people the same sort of thing. Make sure you have it and make sure everything has more than one use so you're not carrying yeah. lots of extra stuff. So now you had mentioned you had been, you know, racing other teams and things like that. So have you done, have you done like racing competitively before this big journey? Yeah, um, there's a race in uh, from Churchill to Gillum, uh, the Hudson Bay Quest. So I, I did. I've done that three times. Um, you know, when I first started rate running, you know, I've only just been running dogs like a really relatively short time. You know, I'm mean, only six within my six years. So uh, I still feel like a newbie uh, in the dog world. That's for sure. Um, but I really, uh, you know. I love, like, I feel like I, you know, I trust my dogs. They trust me. And I trust myself outside, and I trust that I know know how to look after us. us. And so, um, yeah, but I've raced uh, a couple times, and I'd like to race again in the future, uh, absolutely. But now that we're going to a different place, there's going to be a whole new world of, of dogs. But that's why I wanted to do this excursion, you know, is because that's what the world of dog mushing is right now. It's kind of like either you're doing tours or you're racing. Uh, and I wanted to sort of just experience what it was like you know hundreds of years ago when people were out in the land for a couple months at a time with their dogs traveling the land you know watching the landscape change and experiencing that with your dog you know nothing's cooler than laying outside with your dog team and ever and all you're just looking up at the northern lights while they're just crackling over your head i mean like that kind of stuff you know it's like that's the stuff you see in the movies man like i want to i wanted to do that uh, i want to experience that and so that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're traveling with our team. We're getting back to the roots, you know. We're getting back to the purpose of the dogs, which was to travel, which was to, you know, they carried mail and supplies and all this sort of thing. So that's that's the kind of the, you know, a good inspiration for what we're, you know, trying to do here. Really awesome. Now you're using a lot of high technology, modern technology to track your journey and to bring yep. the journey to the world. So can you tell us about how people can follow your journey and uh, and and follow along with you? Yeah, so uh, basically everything's running off my uh, Facebook page. That's the main official page for, for the run home. That's where all the updates and stuff are, uh, Facebook and Instagram. But if you go to bossdogexpeditions.com, so it's B-O-S-S, -S, dogexpeditions.com. Then there's links to all the social media pages as well as the live tracking. Everything's going to be linked right there. Um, so that's, you know, and I got a, I got a crew that's really working social media for me. So when I'm kind of out in a blackout zone for four days, like they're still on there posting and replying and keeping people up to date and answering questions. So we're really trying and making a lot of effort to make this interactive you know, I want people to be able to feel like they know silly questions, you know, like uh, what we want to do is educate. So we want people to ask. We want people to reach out. We want people to be curious. Um, and so, you, and yeah, you can go to that website and you can get linked up and you can start following the pages and you can get right involved. 
That's really awesome. So what's next? So you said that you were going to get into dog training. You said you were going to continue running. So once this, this expedition is done, right, you're going to land in New Brunswick. You know, you're going to take some time yeah. to reintegrate in society. So what's the next challenges for you? Uh, well, we're going home. We're setting up shop. You know, we're going off grid, me and my, me and my girlfriend. Uh, so we're going to spend some time setting up a homestead with the dogs and our little project there. Um I'm going to, you know, and again, like I said, I'm going to open up uh, a club, so to speak, or a dog-powered adventure program. So we'd like people to still come, and, you you know, I'm going to be busy with the dogs, and we're going to work hard to get people coming out to our place and want to drive them around and show them off and let people experience it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as far as the future goes, the next real thing that's on my mind is the Yukon Quest. Uh, I, I really want to go and, and run that race um, and so I think, you know, and I'd like to do it with this, a lot of dogs that I got right now, uh, in a couple more years, my dogs are really young right now. Like, you know, they're, this is the thing. They're two, most of them are two and a half, three years old. So, you know, they're, they, I'm spending extra time, uh, you know, showing them how to look after themselves out there. You know, just to give you an example, like the first night we ran, you know, the dogs think you're going home. They're waiting to go back to their house. And I had spent all this time, you know, preparing mats for them. Like I got a, you know, a bunch of caribou hides and, and scraped them down and cleaned them all off, stretched them, dried them for the dogs right at the rest line. And I set them out and the dogs are just sitting there and they're just sitting there and they're sitting there. And I'm in the cabin and I'm just looking at them like, what? Come on, guys, lay down. You know, you just ate. I know you're tired. You just ran six hours. And they're not laying down. And I just felt sick to my stomach, you know, and I was like, okay, so what do I do? And so my gut said, Justin get outside so i grabbed my sleeping bag grabbed my caribou hide and grabbed all my shit i ran outside laid down and set it all down the dogs are all watching me and i crawled in my bag and i laid down on it right beside them and i peeked out of my bag you know i was watching them and, they, and slowly but surely within five minutes every dog was laying down asleep and then, so that was the thing it's like you got to remember you know i, I this you know the, I, i'm the leader i'm responsible for these dogs you know I'm in charge of them. I have to, you know, make sure that they, I got to show them. I got to teach them. So, you know, that was a very valuable lesson that I was learned in day one, right off the bat. And so that's kind of, you know, but, you know, having saying that, you know, this, this is going to give my dogs a lot of experience. We're going to be, we're not going to be the same people and same dogs at the end of this as we, we were going in. So I feel like it'd be great to, you know, I want to carry on doing these adventures. I want to travel. So I'm sure I'll pick another route and I'll go up to there and I'd like to do the Yukon quest. And I want to, I want to travel with my team. So that's, that's the future is just what we're doing right now, but we're going to do it some more with some other things. How beautifully inspiring. Uh, that sounds like such an amazing, amazing thing that the dogs take such cues. Now, do you have, I know a lot of mushers uh, speak of this. I am no different. When you're you're out there minding your own business and you're, you're, you're out there mushing, and then all of a sudden, squirrel runs across the trail. It just causes <laughs> chaos. Oh, yeah. That's the, that's the on-by command. <laughs> uh, leave it alone. Keep going. <laughs> I just say never mind. That's mine. Never mind. Never mind. You know, like just forget it. But yeah, there's lots of wildlife, and that's something that I'm. I enjoy watching the dogs with that because they're always looking. You know, I always wonder what are they thinking about. They're just sitting there running, and you know, and it's like I know they got to be thinking about something. Like, you know, like what's going on in their minds, and you can see them sniffing and looking around. I got a couple hunters that are always just ears up. You know, looking in the bushes, and yeah, they spot things all the time. I like it because it shows me. They'll see stuff before I do. Uh, but, yeah, from time again to squirrels, we've seen Arctic fox. We've seen five car uh, 30 caribou and five moose. Uh, we ran right beside an Arctic fox. Uh, you know, like, there's lots of wildlife out here, and, and, and the dogs like it. But they're pretty good. I got, I, you know, I got the dog. They'll go by for me. We they haven't, they haven't pulled me off into the bushes yet, so we, we've always stayed on track they get a bit excited they got a couple that try to get over there but most of them most of them just want to keep going you know they're really driven they get it they want to keep moving so very cool 
Well, I would definitely uh, like to have you back on the show sometime in the future when you're back, you know, and settled and, and this expedition is all over for you um, because Absolutely. I'm sure both you and the dogs will be different, you know, different individuals when you come back. But I want to thank you for taking your time out of your massively busy schedule to come and speak with us and the world about the great expedition that you were doing. So, again, we can follow you on your on your uh, your Facebook page and on your website. So that sounds fantastic. But thank you very much for being on the show. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So thanks again for listening to the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. And, of course, we want to hear from you. We love feedback on our episodes. So you can go ahead and tweet us at BF Bushcraft. You can send us stuff, pictures on Instagram at Barefoot Bushcraft. You can send us a message through Facebook on our Facebook page. You can even call us at one 866 Four eight one three six two extension three zero zero. Leave us a voicemail. I always are, are, am very very grateful to have you as a listener for our show. Great gratitude to that. We look forward to entertaining you next week. Thanks again for listening. I'm the Wolfman, and we see you on the flip side. Bye, bye, bye.